Well, I guess you know the big recall election is Tuesday, and it brings up an important point. I touched on it last week, the Republicans just falling all over themselves, trying to make a case for Arnold Schwarzenegger, demonstrating once and for all that the Republicans will do anything to win an election. And I referred to this as a symptom of the pathetic state of politics. Well, this last week, National Review Online, you know, National Review, the conservative magazine, probably the leading conservative magazine, it's been around for almost 50 years, and Stephen Moore had an article on National Review Online, and you can even see the article if you go to my website and go to the Radio Links page. Stephen Moore used to be with the Cato Institute. He's an economist, a very good writer, a very good speaker, and someone I've had the pleasure of meeting a few times, and I have a lot of respect for him. But he has really fallen off the deep end with this. He makes the conservative case for Arnold Schwarzenegger. And in the process, he touches on an important point, a point that I believe is very important. First of all, what he says in the article is that he's met both of the main Republican candidates, and there is no doubt, he says, that the man with the best set of policy ideas is Tom McClintock. And then, of course, he, after regaling us with all of McClintock's virtues, he goes on to point out that McClintock just can't win. How many times have we heard that before? Taft couldn't win, so we wound up with Eisenhower and bigger and bigger government. And it just goes on and on with the Republicans. If the Republican or some potential candidate can't win, well, then we can't have him. Because Moore makes the point that a California cannot stand another 20 minutes of Gray Davis or Cruz Bustamante. So he has to go to Arnold Schwarzenegger then, and he gives us the case for Schwarzenegger. He points out that he has reservations and he has good reason to be skeptical about some things, but then he starts grabbing at straws. He says Schwarzenegger's economic heroes are Milton Friedman and Adam Smith. Well, hurrah, hurrah. And he goes on from there to say that Schwarzenegger thinks like a supply cider. He understands that growth really is the key to restoring a balanced budget and bringing back the glory days of the California economy. Well, every candidate in the race thinks that growth is necessary to balance the budget. And then Moore goes on to make the point that one of the benefits of a Schwarzenegger governorship is that McClintock may very well be directly or indirectly running the economic policymaking shop. McClintock has better ideas on the budget and the economy than Arnold does, but Arnold understands that. With Arnold in the governor's office, we would get two for one. Boy, did I get a feeling of deja vu when I read that. I can remember the day before the election for president in 1960, the election between Nixon and Kennedy, and I had already determined not to vote because I couldn't see any difference between them, and a very good friend of mine said that with Nixon in the White House, Goldwater will have access to him. Barry Goldwater will be able to give him advice, and we will be so much better off than with Kennedy. Well, we got Kennedy, and we saw what happened. A few later, years later, we got Nixon, and we got wage and price controls, controls on oil and gas production, uh, off the gold standard, devaluation of the dollar. I mean, the whole nine yards. It was great society, too. So what good would it have done to elect Richard Nixon back in 1960? So Stephen Moore winds up saying, and some California can't afford another 20 minutes, let alone three more years of the bankrupting policies of the Davis-Bustamante tenure. They must be terminated. And here we have the crucial point. Yes, standing completely on principle, one would not vote for Arnold Schwarzenegger. But you have to be practical. And therein lies the rub. And the rub is that trying to be practical is not only unprincipled, it is the most impractical thing you can do. Because by voting for the lesser of two evils, or what you perceive to be the lesser of two evils, you wind up with evil and you convince the powers that be that they don't ever have to offer you anything but evil in order to get your vote. And we have seen it over and over and over again. And people wonder why the Republican Party keeps moving more and more and more towards big government. It's because you keep rewarding them. Every time they hand you somebody like George W. Bush or Robert Dole or Dwight Eisenhower or Richard Nixon, you vote for them. And as long as you're going to vote for them anyway, they will never give you anybody but Arnold Schwarzenegger or George W. Bush. Is it so long ago, the year 2000, that we cannot remember that we had to vote for Bush because anything would be better than Gore? We couldn't stand another four years of a Democrat in the White House. Well, we got Bush. And what we got, of course, was bigger and bigger government, a bigger role for the federal government in education, a bigger role for the federal government in health care, a bigger role for the federal government in welfare, and on and on and on. And, of course, if somebody tries to excuse all this and point out, well, there are ways that Bush is much better than Gore would have been. Bush, for instance, has renounced the Kyoto Treaty, the environmental treaty that would have imposed strict controls on the U.S. economy. Well, has, did anybody notice that the Senate... Before Bush even got into office, the Senate had already rejected the treaty unanimously. There was never any danger of that treaty being implemented, and so Bush was completely safe in renouncing it because he wouldn't lose votes from either side as a result of it because it was a non-entity. 
He said we needed to take steps to privatize Social Security. Well, his program, of course, for that is much too little, much too late, and is not really privatizing at all, but he hasn't even proposed anything to Congress yet. So scratch that one off, too. So he's coming out for same-sex marriage, uh, against, pardon me, coming out against same-sex marriage. Big deal. The Constitution doesn't give the federal government the right to define marriage between any two people or any two living things on the face of the earth. That is no business of the federal government, and we're supposed to be thankful that Bush is in the White House? Well, he's a good Christian, but Bill Clinton used to carry his Bible to church every week. He was a good Christian, too, at least as far as any profession was made, and all we know about Bush is what he chooses to tell us. So we try to be practical, and all we get in exchange for that practicality is the most impractical results, which are bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger government. It looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to win the election on Tuesday that Davis will be recalled and Schwarzenegger will win the second vote and be the new governor. I don't make predictions. I don't believe it is given to human beings to be able to predict the future, to be able to predict human action. And the only reason it seems that way is because nobody ever goes back and checks all the predictions that were made last year. If they did, they'd be amazed to find how few of them, by coincidence or luck, just happened to come true. But I can tell you this, that I feel a great, great sense of probability that within two years of Schwarzenegger taking office, there will be a major tax increase in California. Schwarzenegger will blame it on the Democratic legislature. He'll say they would not put through the cuts that I wanted, and therefore we have to have a tax increase. I hate raising taxes, but we have no choice or California will go bankrupt. California will never again be able to float a bond issue in the bond market if we don't put through this tax increase and balance the budget, just like George H.W. Bush said back in 1991. And, of course, nobody will bother to mention that Schwarzenegger could have vetoed all of those things that the Democratic legislature will have done. But like George W. Bush today, he probably will not veto a single bill. Meanwhile, Schwarzenegger will put through the legislature some of his ridiculous plans, such as a public-private partnership to develop hydrogen as a means of powering automobiles in California, as though California's environmental standards weren't already the worst in the nation. Public-private partnership. Now, what, is, what sounds familiar about that? Oh, yeah. Big business and big government working together for the benefit of the fatherland. That's the definition of fascism. That's what Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and Franklin Roosevelt had in mind. Government and business working together. Government setting the rules and business carrying it out as their government's flunky. Well, those are my ideas about practicality and principle. Robert, out there in cyberspace, emails to ask, why not press for libertarians in the California recall? Well, if I were voting in the recall election on Tuesday, I would vote for Ned Roscoe, the libertarian. But I have to say that Roscoe has not made a dent as he hoped to do when he was on this show, what was it, six weeks ago, I guess. He hoped to sneak into the governorship by working through their cigarette stores throughout the state and gaining the support of smokers who comprised a large enough share of the California electorate that he thought with so many candidates running he might be able to sneak into the governor's mansion. Well, it doesn't appear that that's been the case because he hasn't shown up in any polls that I have seen anyway. And because he thought he might be able to win, he, of course, took a very, I won't say moderate, but subdued approach to libertarian themes. And the result of that has been that his campaign has not achieved anything at all. And that's really unfortunate. The best thing a libertarian candidate can do at this stage of the game is to use the campaign as a platform for getting across libertarian ideas and letting people know that there are better alternatives out there than what they're getting from the two major parties. And even if you don't get a lot of votes, you can change a lot of minds. And that has happened in a number of elections where libertarians have done very, very well as campaigners, even if they don't pile up that many votes. So it's unfortunate that libertarians get afflicted with this disease, this feeling that I really have a chance to win. And I say that with all due respect because I have a great deal of admiration for Ned and his father, John Roscoe, who I think are marvelous libertarians personally and marvelous people and have a tremendous record not only in business but in spreading the libertarian message through every medium that has been available to them over the years. Well, let's get somebody else's opinion. Let's go to Washington now and talk with Jonathan. Good evening, Jonathan. Hey, H.B., how are you? I'm just fine. What's up? I'll tell you, uh, before I say what I called to say, I have to say that I think the biggest problem with your radio show is that it's only on once a week. I really, I wish it were on every day because I just love listening to you that much. Well, thank you. But um, i got to tell you, I'm a little bit discouraged tonight uh, over a couple of things that have happened recently. Um, the First, the other day I was in a bookstore and I saw a copy of Larry Elder's book, Showdown, which was the last book that was published. 
by him. Uh, I hadn't read it. I read it, uh, another book that he had written called uh, "The Ten Things You Can't Say About uh, Ten Things You Can't Say in America." Right. And um, I enjoyed that, so I picked up this copy of Showdown. And on the cover, it said, "Now include something along the lines of now includes a new chapter about why I became a Republican." Mm-hmm. And um, I skimmed through the chapter, and it was basically, from what I gathered, uh, a number of different things, such as that he felt um, the Republicans had uh, George Bush was uh, sounding uh, more like a libertarian than predecessors had in <laughs> regards to Social Security and vouchers and things of that nature. Also, he didn't like what he feels is the weak uh, libertarian view on foreign policy matters. And um, he also didn't feel that the, the Libertarian Party, even though he said he'd, he'd never actually been a member of the Libertarian Party, he felt that it wasn't uh, moving in the right direction. So I was very disturbed by this, since I had admired Larry Elder greatly. Well, um, I admire him, that. too. I think he's a terrific entertainer. I think he is a very forceful communicator, and I have a lot of respect for him. But I think we come back right now, once again, to practical versus principled. And what happens here is that an individual comes to the conclusion that being a libertarian is going nowhere. You have no chance to win whatsoever, so I ought to be where the action is, where there's a chance to succeed, where there's a chance to bring something about. And for many libertarians, that's the Republican Party. Once having made that decision, then it becomes necessary to justify all the things that the Republicans do. Well, Bush has got the right idea on Social Security. He has a very libertarian view on Social Security. Right. Uh, right. He's got a very libertarian view on education in that he wants parents to be able to choose. And libertarians believe in choice, don't they? Uh, you know, and on and on and on. And I have seen this many, many times. And that's what Stephen Moore was doing, in effect, in that article on Schwarzenegger. Once somebody has made that decision that to be practical, I must go with the Republicans, or if they're anti-war and anti a lot of the social uh, conservative views, then I have to go with the Democrats. But once having made that decision, whichever it is, I then have to justify it, and I have to look for principled libertarian positions where they don't exist. Yeah, and, and I was disturbed to hear you read that uh article by Stephen Moore as well, because I've read... Uh, I, I oh, he's, he's written plenty of things. Jonathan, i got to take a break. Hang on and give okay. us the second thing that uh, depressed you this week. Okay, sure. Well, welcome back. Harry Brown here, and we're talking with Jonathan in Washington, D.C., who has experienced two events this past week that put him on a downer. One was reading why Larry Elder decided to come out as a Republican rather than a Libertarian, as he had been calling himself for several years. One thing I might mention about that, Jonathan, before we go on, is that his dispute with us about foreign policy... Uh, is a real dispute. He has felt that way right from the beginning. And, in fact, the first time I was ever on his show, we could not get off that issue. I was on for at least a solid hour, and I kept trying to change the subject after it had been established that we don't agree on this, and both of us had stated our views, and he just kept bringing it back to foreign policy. And this was long before 9-11, of course. And then the next time I was on, he almost immediately made it clear at the start of the interview that we weren't going to get into foreign policy, that we have agreed to disagree on that, and we talked about all sorts of other things like the drug war and many other things. And I'm sure that he would say today that the drug war is a giant boondoggle and a great detriment to America, and he would continue to agree with us on many points. But he will, of course, find reasons to support the Republicans. Now, what was the other event that yeah, hit I'm you this week? I'm sure his views haven't changed. I just That dejected me, and it, I just threw down a book in disgust and just walked out of the <laughs> The store, and that, that happened yesterday. And then today, I found out that a number of libertarians in California, a significant number, including several prominent ones, such as Art Olivier, who was your running mate in 2000 for vice president, um, Richard Ryder, who was a former candidate for governor out there, Dick Body, who was a former candidate for senate out there, uh, for senate out there, was uh, they're supporting Tom McClintock publicly. Hmm. How it's did people. you How did you find this out? Um, I had there was an article linking to a site called, I believe. I don't really want to give the site's name out. Um, well, I'd certainly like to see it. Do you want to email it to me? Perhaps I should. I just don't feel like giving it free publicity, but uh, I don't know. You know, maybe maybe it's not that big of a deal. Well, um, I would like to see the site, so if you're not going to say it here, I'm, I'm letting you off the hook if you promise to email me the address. I will definitely email it to you. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. Um, and maybe, I, you know, maybe I'm, not being, I'm being irrational about that, but I, I, I don't know. I can't. You know, make a decision right, right on myself. I will definitely email it to you. All right, I appreciate um, that. Jonathan, all sorts of things come up that interfere with our plans for a better future for America, and we just have to take them in stride because none of them are fatal, and yet on the other hand, a lot of th good things happen as we go along, and it seems as though the progress is teeny-weeny and the setbacks are major. But as a matter of fact, I think that there are far more people 
in America today that have libertarian ideas than was the case 10 years ago. And there are far more people spouting libertarian ideas publicly in one kind of forum or another. And maybe they aren't as libertarian as you or I might are, are, am, were, whatever, or we would like people to be, but they're a lot more libertarian than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And if we can just hold on to this country for another few years, there may be some breakthrough at some point that begins to change the momentum. It is just amazing how things suddenly turn around at a time when it seems so very unlikely. That's the way bull markets end in stocks or the way bear markets end in stocks or any other investment. It's the way culture changes. Suddenly, everything is that was in is out and everything that was out is in just like yeah. 1984 with uh, orwell's eurasia and east asia suddenly the next thing you know everything has been reversed black is white and white is black well, i'm not promising anything but keep your chin up let me just say one last thing and then i'll let you get to somebody else um i i don't it blows my mind that some libertarians can support republicans in big elections and then complain when other voters refuse to pay any attention to the libertarian party right in my opinion this, the only good reason for there to even be a libertarian party is for candidates to talk about things that are strikingly different from the Democrats and Republicans, and if some libertarians are content to back candidates who merely offer to tinker with the, the status quo, then I don't even understand why they're not in the Republican or Democrat party. And that's yeah, what uh, both, both points that you make there are right on. The only reason to run for office is to present ideas that are significantly different from what the Republicans and Democrats are presenting. Otherwise, why would anybody vote for you? If you want a 15% tax cut instead of a 10% tax cut, well, then who cares? What difference does it make? And the other guys get a chance to win, and you don't. So why in the world would he vote for you? Why would he even pay attention to you? Why would he even think about joining your party? Why would he think that libertarians are any different from Republicans? And so on down the line. Jonathan, thanks so much for calling. Thanks. And right now we're going to go to Pittsburgh and talk with Rob. Good evening, Rob. Hey, Harry Brown. <clears throat> I say right on to you and right on to that uh, first guest of yours. You both said a lot of interesting things tonight and made a lot of good points. I used to, I've always liked Larry Elder, too. I mean, what little I know about him, but... Uh, and I still do. It's very disappointing, though, that I always get disappointed when people, you know, it's like you say about choosing the lesser of two evils. But I want to ask you about somebody else. Um, you, you've heard me tell you before that I learned about you from C-SPAN, and um, another libertarian thinker I learned about uh, on C-SPAN was Charles Murray. Uh, have you met him? Yes, yes, very nice fellow. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know whether you know what sort of opinion you had of him um, uh, philosophically or personally, but uh, I was kind of wondering if you would ever consider having him as a guest on your show. Well, that's not a bad idea. I generally like to find as a guest somebody who has some significant reason for being here other than just agreeing with me. <laughs> well, but wait a second. There's one area where I thought you guys could really uh, get contentious, and it could be interesting. I was listening to an interview with him archived at some website. I can't remember where it was now, but... Um, he, he said a lot of things that I might expect somebody like you to say, but he said something that I think you and I would both see as problematic, and that is he advocates not government. He says, oh, he's against government control of education, but he believes that government funding of education is necessary. And I was thinking, well, I think, and I'm sure Harry Brown would say, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'll bet Harry Brown would point out that that's basically impossible. You cannot have the government fund something without having input into you know, controlling sure. it to some degree. Yes, I have trouble remembering things as far back as when I read his last book. The title was something like What It Means to Be a Libertarian. And it was a very interesting book and very innovative in some of the ideas he had. He's not what I would call a hardcore libertarian, but he's far from being a Republican or a Democrat. And he had some interesting ideas such as anybody could, for instance, any manufacturer could disregard the Federal Trade Commission rules or the FDA rules or any of these other rules of the regulatory agencies if they printed on the label in prominent letters that this has not been approved by the FDA or this has not been approved by the FTC or the SEC or whatever it is and let people make up their own minds whether they want something that's been regulated by the government or something that's unregulated and may, as a result of being unregulated, cost a lot less money than the regulated product and let people decide for themselves. Why does it have to be coercive? And I thought that was very interesting. Now, of course, my point of view would be the federal government has no business whatsoever in any of this economic regulation, and it should all be ended, and all those agencies should be abolished. But for somebody who, who's taking a view to say, here, come with us 10 yards instead of 15 yards, I think that's a very innovative suggestion. And he has a lot of suggestions like that, but in the process, I think he uh, advocates school choice or one or two of those other kinds of things that I don't see. Not, I not only don't see them as being helpful, I see them as being dangerous. School huh. choice, for instance, is a way for the government to get its hooks into private schools and wind up controlling them the way they control private colleges today because of all the federal aid that goes to colleges. But anyway, I think he is a very interesting guy. I, I just would hate to get in a big argue with, argument with him because <laughs> I like him too much. Uh. He's, he's really a very pleasant fellow, and I also like him because he endorsed me for president <laughs> in 2000. Yeah. So, but uh, he is an interesting person, and to anybody else listening, if you run across something of his, you won't be disappointed if you read him because he not only has 
interesting ideas, but he's also a very good writer. And that's very important to me. If, if somebody isn't a good writer, you're not going to read more than a page or two or three before you start getting drowsy, put the book down, and never hear anything that the person has to say. Do you have any other ideas? For well, us? there's one other thing I wanted to say. <clears throat> and um, I, I might have, you know, I've mentioned to you before that I've, lately I've been attending the meetings uh, of the Libertarian Party of Pittsburgh, uh, the monthly. And um, the, I'd like to give you a, a, a URL. Maybe you could put it on your links. It's uh, www. L, I'm sorry, www.lpth.org. And that's the Libertarian Party of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, now, there's a particular animated segment that you can see at that website. You can probably see it at several other websites, but I don't know which ones. But if you go to that website and you click on the link that says Philosophy, there's a five-minute uh, flash animation presentation. I cannot remember who wrote the text and who did the animation. They're, they are credited. One person who should also have been credited in the credits on this animation <coughs> is... Um, Mike Oldfield, the, the musician, he wrote the music. They used music from Tubular Bells. And the combination of animation, text, and music in this animation is so powerful. It's, it's one of the most powerful introductions to libertarian thinking I've ever seen. And it reduces everything down to really basic principles about the individual as owner of his or her own life. Mm -hmm. And it really it, it, it breaks everything down in, into such fundamental principles that it doesn't even get into... Um, you know, the kind of specific things that we usually talk about when we talk about government and politics. And well, sure, because you're, you're talking about an introduction here rather than a course. But, it, but it's, it's, more, it's, it's, all, it's all the more powerful, though, because it really gets down to the nuts and bolts of you own your life and mm -hmm. what that means in terms of um, power, force, uh, individual liberties, um, property. Uh, I mean, it's, it, I can't describe it. I'm just... Okay, uh, you, don't, you don't need to. Uh, anybody that wants to go look at it, lppgh.org, and I'll go take a look at it myself. lppgh.org, Libertarian Party of Pittsburgh. Yeah, Rob, I highly recommend it to anybody, whether they're new to libertarianism or whether they're not new to it. It's, it's, it's really worth checking out. Okay, terrific. Thanks for calling, Rob. Always you, glad sir. to hear from you. Thank you. We have some emails. David in Minneapolis says, In the past week we heard more and more about Arnold Schwarzenegger's past sexual assaults on several women. And the response to this news is giving me deja vu about the 1990s. Back then, Anita Hill public revealed, pa publicly revealed past wrongdoing by Republican Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas. And the only people who gave a damn were Democrats. Similarly, when Paula Jones public re publicly revealed past wrongs by President Clinton, Clinton, the only people who gave a damn were Democrats. So why is it that it's only the opposition party that does? Well, let's talk about that when we come back. This is Harry Brown. Be back here in two minutes. Before we went to the break, I was referring to an email from Dave in Minneapolis who mentioned that the Democrats leaped to support Anita Hill when she accused Clarence Thomas of wrongdoing. Then, of course, the Republicans leaped to support Paula Jones when President Clinton was accused of wrongdoing. And now the only he says the only people who seem to care about Schwarzenegger's past wrongdoing are people who were opposed to the recall in the first place. Why can't we deal with these kinds of accusations consistently and in a fair and balanced manner instead of simply responding to them along the lines of pure politics? If someone I disagree with commits a crime, is it any worse than the same crime committed by someone I agree with? Of course it's not any different, Dave, but this is not a matter of principle. This is a game, a game called politics. And what you do is you leap on anything you can find to attack your opponent. And I don't just mean if you are a candidate. I mean whoever it is you're supporting in the race. And anybody who attacks your candidate is evil and malicious, and he is just making political hay, and so you must rush to support your candidate without questioning in any way whatsoever ever the truth or falsity of the charges. They're bound to be false if they're about your candidate, and they're bound to be true if they're about the opposition candidate. Well, Jonathan sent me that link, and it is for real, folks. Libertarians throughout California, prominent libertarians, are supporting Tom McClintock, the Republican, in the recall. Not only the former vice presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party, but two former state Libertarian chairmen, a former Libertarian council member, the former Libertarian for U.S. Senate candidate, twice candidate for Congress once, former chair of the Orange County Libertarian Party, a Libertarian candidate for governor in 1998, and it just goes on and on and on with the list of all these prominent Libertarians who are supporting Tom McClinock. Now, I can understand that, but I sure as heck do not agree with it. Because there's one thing that's being overlooked here, and that is these people have no idea what's likely to happen if Tom McClintock gets elected. Do you really think that Tom McClintock is going to carry out libertarian programs once he's governor? Yes, he may resist raising taxes far, far longer than Schwarzenegger. But he is absolutely unlibertarian on all social issues, and he is unlibertarian on immigration, and he is a politician. Not only that, he's a Republican politician. I do admire the way the fact he is, that he is not 
caved in and gotten out of the race as all the Republican leaders want him to, but he is still a politician. And for all I know, he may announce tomorrow or Monday that he's pulling out of the race, in which case it would do probably very little good for Schwarzenegger because the chances of very many people hearing about that who are going to vote on Tuesday in just a day or two is very slim, and his name will still be on the ballot on Tuesday, as will be the name of Peter Uberoth and the other Republicans who have dropped out of the race in deference to Arnold Schwarzenegger. It really is unfortunate. As Jonathan pointed out, how can these people in California try to lecture others about the wasted vote syndrome, the idea that the only way you waste your vote is when you vote for someone you don't really agree with, but you just think is the lesser of two evils? How are they ever going to convince people to vote libertarian, knowing that a libertarian probably has very little chance of winning whatever the race is, when they themselves have come out in support of a Republican, contrary to a libertarian who has been endorsed by the state libertarian party, that being Ned Roscoe? Well, politics makes strange bedfellows, and politics makes people a little bit crazy. If you go to my website, harrybrown.org, and click on the radio page, and then click on links to articles and websites mentioned on the broadcast, you'll see Stephen Moore's article on Schwarzenegger, but you'll also see another couple of articles that I found very interesting. They have to do with the war in Iraq. One of them talks about the way the war was presented before it's actually started, and the overwhelming bias of the networks, all of them, from PBS straight on through to Fox News, from one end of the spectrum to the other, in presenting administration spokesmen to talk about the war and not a really balanced view of skeptics and other people who had important arguments to point out. And it really is a very interesting article. The other one is a study about the misperceptions that people have today and how that's been affected by the networks and the amazing misperceptions that people have. This is a result of a poll that was just taken. Misperceptions, thinking that weapons of mass destruction have been found in Iraq, thinking that links between al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein have been found in Iraq and all sorts of things like that. And it breaks them down by which network these people watch to come up with these misperceptions. And if we have time between phone calls later, I'll go into some of these results, but you can see them for yourself if you go to the radio links page at my website, harrybrown.org. But we've been talking about the California recall election tonight. Now it's about time we talk to somebody who's actually on the ground there. Well, standing up, I hope. Let's talk with Chuck in Fortuna, California. Chuck, is that Fortuna or Fortune? It's Fullerton. <laughs> well, was I close? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that you were right on. I'm thinking that the person that typed enough thing in there probably was the one that was off. <laughs> okay, Fortin. I, I lived at one time in La Habra, so I certainly ought to have oh, yeah, that straight. north of me. Yes. The question that I have is I want to tap into your vast resources of information about political things or things political. The Rasmussen poll shows that of those people who, can, who identify themselves as libertarian, they show 16% of the American people identify themselves as libertarian. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there is a Gallup poll that shows as much as 24% people identify themselves as libertarian. Yes, at one time, and this was several years ago, was the last time I saw something like this. I, I believe it was between my two campaigns. It was sometime like 97, 98, 99, somewhere in there. There was a poll, I believe it was Gallup, and showed that the largest segment was conservative. And that was something like 25, 28, 30 percent. The second largest was libertarian, which was around 20 or 18 or something like that. And the third largest was liberal. And then there were some other designations that uh, rounded out the rest of it. And I probably have the figures wrong. Uh, they may be quite wrong. But I do remember that it was quite a surprise to find that libertarians came in second to conservatives, that the country has swung more to the right, so-called. And But in the midst of all of this, that many, many people identify themselves as libertarian. And I believe that Gallup gave them some positions, positions on issues in order to help establish where that person was on the political spectrum. I think the Rasmussen poll actually took the, uh, 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 administered the um, the test. The, oh, the uh, world's smallest political quiz? Right, the world's smallest political quiz, right. Yeah, they, they call it the diamond they arrived chart. at 16%. But my question is this. If we are 16% or 24%, in reality, why are we only a half a percent in registration? Is and, that, and in elections. Is that a harbinger of a huge, huge failure on the part of the Libertarian Party? I don't believe so, but certainly somebody could disagree with me about that. It's a matter of opinion, and perhaps it derives from what you think has to be done, colors one's judgment about what the cause of that is. But I believe that we're back to this practical versus principle again, that people simply do not take the Libertarian 
position seriously with regard to elections. They may take it seriously with regard to ideology and think, yes, I want government out of my life. No, I don't want a 10% tax cut. I want to get rid of the income tax. No, I don't agree with the drug war. No, I don't agree with the government running around the world uh, trying to build nations everywhere and bring democracy to other people at my expense and at my risk. But when it comes time to vote in an election, there are only two choices in their eyes. They may be aware there's a libertarian candidate on the ballot, but he doesn't have a chance to win. It's going to require one of two things, and to a certain extent the two overlap. Now, this is my opinion on this. I believe that it is very important to continue doing outreach and specifically with one particular interim goal in mind, and that is to build the size of the Libertarian Party. There was a great campaign on between the two elections of 96 and 2000 to build the size of the party. It was called Project Archimedes, and between the 96 campaign and Archimedes, the party tripled in membership from around 10,000 up to 35,000. It hit a high in November 98 when the party abandoned this, and it has been on a downward slope ever since, and it is now down, I believe, to under 20,000. The reason that that membership is important is because these are the people who are going to do the outreach, who are going to pass out the leaflets and the literature and things of this sort. These are the people who are going to donate money to campaigns to get the word out. These are the people who, from whom we have to draw talented people, skilled people, to communicate, to do all sorts of other things. And the object of Archimedes was to build the party to 200,000 members. And the idea was that with 200,000 members, we could perhaps perhaps change the world, change the United States, change the electoral situation. And I thought it was a wonderful idea, but it has unfortunately completely been abandoned by the party. Now, the second possibility is that if we keep doing outreach, if we keep talking about libertarian ideas, how much better you would be in your personal life if we repealed the income tax completely and gave up all these federal programs which can't begin to match the cost to you of the income tax, that can't begin to match that in benefits to you. Here's what you could do for your retirement if you weren't paying that 15% Social Security tax. And continue this on and on. What can happen somewhere along the line is that instead of appealing to Chuck in Fullerton and appealing to Harry in Nashville, we might appeal to somebody who does have the clout. We might reach somebody and strike a chord for that somebody who has the money, who has the talent, yeah. who has the influence to make an, an enormous, a significant difference almost overnight, either by running for office or by creating a situation whereby somebody else can run for office, say, for President of the United States with $15 million instead of the $2.5 million that I ran with in the year 2000. Not that that person is going to win, but he might get 8 or 10% of the vote, and that would change politics in this country forever because well, then people I'm would have to take the party seriously. I think your approach in the 2000 election, you know, the great libertarian promise, mm -hmm. I think it would have harvested a lot more votes. In fact, I think it would have harvested at least three times the number of votes that you got had there not been such a strong contention between Bush and Gore. And had it not been so You mean the race was so close? The race was so close that people could not afford a... Or many people felt like they couldn't afford a protest vote, you know, for... I, I understand you, and I think that you're entirely right about that, but we shouldn't overestimate what it would have been like if it had been a landslide from the beginning, if Bush or Gore was favored to win with 55 or 60 percent of the vote. Because even though I'm sure that I reached more Americans than any libertarian candidate had up until that point, I still think that I didn't reach enough Americans, and I didn't reach them often enough because we simply did not have enough money to advertise strongly. We did run television ads. We did run radio ads. But it isn't enough to reach somebody just once. Somebody can listen to that and say, wow, Boy, that's what I've always wanted, and that's what I've always agreed with, and I've never heard a candidate talk like that before. But between that day and Election Day, he's e going to forget about you, or he's at least going to think, gee, I heard this guy two months ago, and he was great, but I haven't heard from him since. He obviously doesn't have a chance to win. Here's his name on the ballot. I think this is the one that I heard, but he's obviously not that big a deal, so I better vote whatever I think is necessary to make sure that the worst guy doesn't get in. Now, the, the answer to that is to be able to do enough advertising that people see it four, five, eight, ten, fifteen times on television, not just on radio or in, in a leaflet or something else, but on television, because if something is on national television, the aura, the atmosphere about it is that there must be a lot of weight behind this. Even, whether or not I agree with it, it isn't necessarily right, it's not necessarily wrong, it's just that there is some substance to it, or else they wouldn't have the money to be running these ads. And we're talking with Chuck in Fullerton, California. Chuck, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, Harry, I just wanted to say one thing, and that is um, I, I have to disagree with you on those percentages. When you, when 16% of the American people identify themselves as libertarians and only a half a percent register libertarians, I think it indicates a huge, huge, huge failure on the part of the party. Now, it's something that I would like for the party in California and Orange County to think about. I would like for them to think about what it is that we are doing that's driving away those 15.5% that identify themselves as libertarian. Well, I'm not so sure it's driving them away. It's just never attracting them to the party in the first place. Well, And I, I don't know that anything's being done that's driving them away, although there have been a lot of internal 
uh, brouhaha's in the party the last several years, and that may have made some people fed up with what seems like just the same old politics of name-calling and that sort of thing, even within the party. But I think more than anything else, we just have not reached those people and told them that there was a way that they could implement what it is that they believe. And that is unfortunate. But I hope you're making your views known to the people there in California and trying to help them in some way to do what you think is necessary. Well, thank you very much, Harry, and good luck. Well, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate your comments. And please stay with us and let us know of anything else on your mind from time to time. Good night. Good night. An email along the lines of this from Jan in Fort Collins, Colorado, says people feel compelled to vote for the lesser of two evils because of the voting system we use in the United States. It's called plurality voting. However, there are other voting methods that reduce or eliminate the incentive to vote for another candidate instead of or ahead of your true favorite candidate. One excellent method is called approval voting. Instead of voting for just one single candidate for a given office, you can vote for as many candidates as you want. In the, I'm adding this to Chuck's, uh, pardon me, to Jen's email, you can vote for them in order of your preference. My number one choice is this fellow, my number two choice is this woman or whatever. And he says, Jan says, for example, I might vote for Brown, Phillips, and maybe Bush. Whoever gets the most votes wins. With approval voting, there is no reason not to vote for your favorite candidate. You can still, if you wish, choose whichever of the major candidates you would prefer if that's what the choice comes down to. There are a couple of good websites about alternative voting methods that I recommend, and he gives me a couple. And I have put them already up on the radio links page as a result of getting this email, so you can go and get more information about these. One site is approval voting, the citizens for approval voting. The other one is election methods. It explores several different alternative methods, I believe. And Jan winds up by saying, I would also mention that the Libertarian Platform supports alternative voting methods. To clarify this just a little further, this preference system, what you do is you go, and if there's seven candidates, you say, I choose the following in order. This candidate is my number one, this candidate is my number two, this candidate is my number three. And first, all the number one votes are counted. This is, of course, computerized, so it can be done instantaneously. All the number one votes are counted, and if no candidate has a plurality, then the bottom candidate is cut off the list and then check again all the number one votes. If you voted for the number as number one, the candidate who's been cut off the list, then in the second run through, your number two choice is counted. And again, if there's no majority for any one of the candidates, then it goes on to number three and so forth, uh, goes on to the third time through by cutting off another candidate and so on until, if necessary, it gets down to just two candidates. And however many people have voted with one preference number for either of those candidates, those votes get counted, and somehow or other one gets elected. But the beauty of that is that you can vote for the Libertarian candidate. And if you really think that, say, the Democratic candidate would be better than the Republican candidate, you can still vote for the Democratic candidate as number two or number three or number four and not vote for the Republican candidate at all, or vice versa, if you think the Republican candidate would be better and so on. The problem is how are you going to bring that about? I've said many times that I think that before we can change the electoral system in this country, we're, mo we're more likely to be able to elect a libertarian president just by appealing to people uh, with a great libertarian offer to give up their favorite federal programs in exchange for repealing the income tax and never having to pay income tax again, and their children and grandchildren never having to pay income tax. The Republicans and Democrats are not going to consider alternative voting systems because, unfortunately, the two-party system has been imposed upon us by various congressional laws and laws at the state level. It's not something that came about by popular will. I'm not saying don't look into this, and I'm not saying don't promote it. I'm just saying don't get your hopes too high. We've been talking a lot tonight about the California recall, about practical politics versus principle, and the impracticality of practical politics. And I just got an email from Chris in Ann Arbor, who says he has not been, heard the whole show. He just tuned in recently and wondered about the libertarian endorsement of Tom McClintock. Says, I see you answered it. But he points out, he said, we had another politician who got elected based on a half-libertarian platform, meaning not 100%, and that was Jesse Ventura in Minnesota, who was a sort of social libertarian, that is, decriminalized marijuana, prostitution, no gun control, and so on. But then he got into office, and nothing really happened. Well, what a surprise. Jesse Ventura turned out to be, and this is Harry speaking, not Chris in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but Jesse Ventura turned out to be nothing but a self-promoting, self-indulgent, <laughs> self-absorbed individual who, in his first few months in office, started coming out for a light rail mass transit. A very strong libertarian position on that. So back to Chris, he says, how do those libertarians in California know Tom is going to bring California any more closer to liberty than the other candidates? I am not convinced that Tom McClintock is a Ron Paul-style Republican. And Chris goes on to say, as for Arnold, I feel he has been taking the Clinton-Bush correspondence course in political speaking. <laughs> I can't understand where he stands or what he is talking about. 
No wonder he's a darling of the status quo. It worked for Bill Clinton. Why not Schwarzenegger? Well, Chris, it's obvious that from the beginning that's what his advisors advised him to do, and that is take as few positions as possible, just talk about we have to have a change, and we have to bring business back to California. Chris goes on to say the other candidates like Ned Roscoe, the libertarian, Mary Carey, the porn star, and Gallagher, the comedian, say truthfully what they want to do, yet no one pays attention to them, especially in the case of Gallagher. How can one resist a candidate whose campaign slogans include incompetence, corruption, selfishness, continue the California tradition? And why settle for amateurs? California deserves a professional comedian. And then Chris says, finally, someone mentioned the world's smallest political quiz. There is another one out there worth trying out as well, only it's a bit larger and a bit more in-depth, and that's at politicalcompass.org. And I'll try to take a look at it in the next break, and if it looks like I think it's worth anything, any of your time, then I'll put it on the website as a link on the Radio Links page. Oh, and finally, finally, Chris says, I wonder if you have any comments or opinions on the Free State Project, which is a concept whereby 20,000 people move to a state, in this case New Hampshire, and influence the government there towards pro-liberty positions. Well, I've spoken on this several times on this show. I have no objection to anybody who wants to do this and will, it is willing to give up his life where he is now and move to New Hampshire. I'm staying in Nashville, though. Bob says, i got lots of questions, but the main one, do you have any suggestions for a worthy, tax-deductible, libertarian, not-for-profit organization? Well, it just so happens I do, Bob. I'm associated with the American Liberty Foundation, which raises money to run radio and television ads, produces those radio and television ads, and gets them on the air to whatever extent it can raise the money to pay for the ads. And it uh, did quite a good job of producing radio ads, which we ran on this show, against the war in Iraq before the war started. And it had ran a very good campaign against gun control laws that included some excellent television commercials that did run on national television. And now it has a campaign called Downsize DC, which is aimed at repealing the income tax by reducing the federal government to such a small level that there's no need for an income tax, that the government can get by with just the tariffs and excise taxes already being collected. And it that campaign is getting to the next level this coming week by starting to run radio ads on stations around the country. So you can find out more about all of these things by going to AmericanLibertyFoundation.org or you can go to DownsizedDC.org. Either one will tell you about the latest campaign, and if you forget those, just go to my website, HarryBrown.org, and somewhere on the homepage you'll see a link to the American Liberty Foundation. Bob also says, I'm from Alabama, and we just defeated a huge $1.2 billion tax increase proposed by our Republican governor. We're now hearing lots of noise from the media and government that supported the increase that teachers will be laid off, no new books will be purchased, old books will be taped together, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. We want small government, but if the government on their way down is going to take no hostages and make life miserable for everyone just to prove their point, what are we to do? There aren't enough private schools to accommodate all the students if we were to have our way and abolish state control of the schools. Do you have any suggestions for us during this transition? Well, first, just in case it wasn't clear from what Bob said, he was referring to a very good point, and that is any time anybody talks about cutting taxes or not raising them, the politicians never talk about canceling some of those monuments they were going to build or canceling these ridiculous programs that they have. They always talk about slashing the budget for schools or the fire department or the police department or the courts or something else that most people think government ought to do. They don't talk about slashing the welfare budget. They don't talk about the corporate welfare budget or any of the other things. They always make it sound as drastic as possible as though the state could never get along without the budget that it has today. And I believe I pointed out last week that at one time the California budget was a billion dollars. When I lived there around 1960, I seem to remember that it was about $1 billion at the time. And I remember it because somebody made a big thing about the fact that the budget had just risen to the point of $1 billion. Well, today it's over $100 billion. Now, has the population of California increased 100 times over in the last 40 years? Has inflation been 10,000% in the last 40 years? I don't think so. And yet they do not believe that there is a single, single thing that can be cut. Even though the schools were better 40 years ago than they are today, the crime rate was much lower 40 years ago than it is today, drug use was lower 40 years ago than it is today, in every possible way the state has become worse during the year that that budget has increased, but that's what they do. Now Bob asks, what, a, what kind of a transition can we provide? Because privates, there aren't enough private schools in the state of Alabama, for instance, to accommodate all the students if somehow or other we could snap our fingers and end the government school system overnight so that our children were being taught by people who have an interest in teaching them about history, geography, mathematics, and English rather than teaching them how to be good little citizens and devotees of the state. Well, Bob, we're not going to be able to snap our fingers and make it happen overnight. If it does happen someday, if we are fortunate enough that that happens, it's going to take a little bit of time and it's going to be preceded by great public 
debate over it and controversy. And during that time, a lot of people are going to take a chance that the movement to get rid of the government control and the government school system will succeed, and they will start private schools. And even if that were not the case, even if there were a button on my desk right now and I could push it and end, and end government schooling in this country overnight, I still wouldn't worry about it because within a week or two, makeshift schools would develop all over the country. They would be in people's homes. They would be in abandoned warehouses. They would be in garages. They would be wherever is necessary to accommodate students. And maybe they wouldn't have the best textbooks at first, but they would start learning the three R's because that's the only place parents would be willing to send them to send their children when they have any real choice. And I'm not talking about vouchers where you choose between the lesser of evils. I'm talking about shopping around and finding a school that teaches what they want. When my daughter was about to go into kindergarten. I visited many private schools to try to find one for her, and I was disappointed that several of them looked like just replicas of the government schools. In fact, some of them made a big point of the fact that their teachers have the same qualifications and requirements as the government schools do. Well, why then would I bother spending the money for a private school education for my daughter? But eventually, we found two or three schools that really do bear down on academics, and we chose the best one of those, and it was in Fullerton, California, Chuck, and I was never sorry about the decision that was made. The school lived up to its promises. The point, of, however, is that the free market accommodates when the free market is free to do so. Because if people have a need, it means there is a way that somebody else can profit by satisfying that need. Nobody's going to go without an education because there are no government schools. Nobody is going to go without health care because there is no government health care program. The very need that exists for these things that politicians prey upon is the reason that people go into the business of providing schools or health care or health insurance or a hospital or whatever it may be. And the most makeshift facilities that come into being overnight are far better than the most expensive facilities and operations that the government can provide because the government system is not designed to please the customer. The government system is designed to please whoever has the most political influence. And it will never be you, and it will never be me, and it will probably never be anybody listening to this broadcast tonight. That's what's wrong with government programs. Not that they are poorly administered, not that there is waste and corruption in the programs, but that they are based on the very wrong system. Something you pay for directly, where you go into a store and shop around and buy it, is going to be based upon what you need and want. And you will always have a choice because if somebody doesn't provide what you want, someone else will see that as a marketing opportunity to give you what you want. That's why there are so many different companies producing computers, so many different companies producing software, so many different companies producing telephones, so many different companies producing VCRs and television sets, so many different companies producing food and processing it because there are so many different tastes. Turn it over to the government, and it's one size fits all, and that size will be determined by whoever has the most political influence. In the case of schools, it is generally the teachers' unions. In the case of other things, then it's some other pressure group, but it isn't you and it isn't me. Eric says, I live in California, and I am not going to vote. However, I do send money to Ron Paul's campaign in Texas. Even though he is not my congressman, he votes for the principles I believe in, and he wins elections, and then he votes no. I am proud to support Dr. No. A Ron Paul victory is a victory for libertarians everywhere. Well, needless to say, I have a great deal of respect for Ron Paul, more than anything else because he realizes the marriage of practicality and principle. Ron Paul would not be in Congress today if he hadn't stuck to principle. He has made himself unique, and the people in his district would not vote for him if he hadn't. They would not support him as overwhelmingly as they do if he weren't so predictable and so consistent in his voting. And the Republican Party has just had to put up with him as a result of that because they know they can't defeat him. And they have tried. When he decided to go back into Congress, he had been in Congress, I believe it was for four years at the end of the 1970s and the early 1980s, either four or six years at the time, he decided to go back into Congress and ran in 96. And the incumbent was a Republican who had just switched from the Democratic Party a few months before, and Ron Paul ran against him in the primary. The Republican Party gave a lot of money to the incumbent to try to keep him, even though he was nothing but a renegade Democrat and could not be counted on to vote for anything that a Republican would try to convince you was a principle of the Republican Party. Ron Paul beat him in the primary and then beat him, uh, beat the Democrat in the general election. When he ran again in 98 for re-election, the Republicans again tried to unseat him and didn't even come close to doing so, and so they gave up. So now he's been in back in Congress for seven years, and... He is Dr. No, 
and he doesn't suffer for it politically. The Republicans have just learned to put up with him. And that's the whole point about this, that what would be the point of someone like Ron Paul, who believes very strongly in libertarian principles, going to Washington and being a congressman instead of the doctor that he was in private life? What would be the point of going there if all you're going to do is be part of the Republican herd or the Democratic herd? It doesn't make any sense for him as a person, and it doesn't make any sense for the libertarian movement to go there and vote to get along with the powers that be, try to get a better position on a committee, and keep talking about, if I just keep doing this, someday it'll pay off, because it never pays off. And in the same way, it doesn't do you any good to vote for somebody that you think might turn out to be all right, even though he does not espouse libertarian principles. He does not talk about getting the government out of your life. He talks about cutting taxes or not raising taxes, taking a no new taxes pledge or something of this sort, but does not talk about a wholesale change in the whole concept of government at the city level, the state level, or the national level. That this country is going in the wrong direction, that it cannot survive as a free country if it is going to continue making government bigger and bigger, more intrusive, and more oppressive year after year. And, of course, it isn't the free country that it was just 30 or 40 years ago, let alone 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago. It is continuing to move in the wrong direction. And I got an email last week that complained about what I had said, that at least the Republicans are moving in the right direction. Wrong. The Republicans are not moving in the right direction, and I will never vote for someone who isn't trying to reduce government dramatically. That's what freedom is all about, and that's what I'm looking for. This is Harry Brown. I hope you'll be back next week. I really enjoy these Saturday evenings with you. Have a good week, and good night.